some of you may want to know how does a gallery run, what, what is different about it, if you're an artist yourself, how does, how does the whole process take place? Um, some of you may be more interested in how do I choose the artists I choose, why do I do what I do, what inspires that. Um, but I thought I would begin with just a little bit of background so that you would know how I came to be in this position in Chestertown, owning and running a gallery. Um, I also have to say, Anne, you called me a doyen. Do you know what my family has done to me all week long with that word? <laughs> Laura, Laura Wade threatened to bring me a tiara. I mean, it's been, it's been a bit much. But I did look up the word and, and the word is, the definition is quite wonderful because it says someone who is respected. But in every single definition, it also says the oldest one of the people in that, in that grouping. So um, yes, I, I, I take that. I have to confess, Carla, that it was actually I who called you a doyen. And the, that, that when I looked it up, it did not have oldest, that part. Every definition it, that's oldest. That's what I meant. But, <laughs> but in many ways, I, you know, there, are, there are some wonderful few people who have been involved in the arts longer than I have in Chestertown, but I've had a gallery now for 30 years. And if COVID hadn't hit us, um, we would have been celebrating our 30th wonderful anniversary reception in April. It will be coming to you in July, but it will be coming as a online, videoed, private appointment exhibit. Um, but back, let me back up a little bit. How did I get here? How did it all start? And, you know, I think back to my very first job. I worked on Capitol Hill and I did constituent requests. And that meant every single person that was trying to figure out how to get through the federal bureaucracy called the office. And your job was to figure out how to ask the question 20 different ways to all the federal bureaucracies that you had to interact with at that time. So you had to be somewhat creative, but really the skill set I think I gained through that job was networking. Uh, you know, how do, how do I find people who know the answers to the things that I need answers for? The second job I had was my own company. I worked with my partner, Joyce Huber. Uh, many of you know Joyce through the Sultana operation. And Joyce and I have been uh, great friends for 50 years. And we were business partners for 20 years. And um, I, I have to say, the company we had, we did the research and hiring for companies in Washington, DC. So we did the staffing. Now, those of you that know me, and I, I'll look down here at Pam, who, and oh, actually Mark too. I never get my bills out on time. I forget you owe me money. I'm absolutely useless as a business owner because Joyce did all of that. My job was the people and the clients and making, making those connections. And it was a good, good 20 years and I loved, I loved every single part of it. In my 40s, um, I went through a number of life events that required introspection and thinking about how I might change things. Um, that wonderful Rilke statement of you must change your life really was hammering home with me. It, it, what I was doing was no longer satisfying. And I moved to Chestertown and loved being here in Chestertown, but made the fatal mistake of buying the Imperial Hotel with my husband. Don't, don't do it. If you are not a restaurateur, don't do it because it's the hardest work in the world. But being miserable and owning the Imperial Hotel during that time period, the thing that I chose to do was to do a series of exhibits in the hotel lobby. And we had a kennel in the back for hunters and their, their dogs. And I quickly got rid of all the cages and turned it into a gallery. And that was where we first started doing our shows. Um, my, my, my sort of career as a collector, and by the way, for anybody in this group that's an artist, um, I am not one. I, I don't have crayons, I, I don't have paint. I have never ever in my life created a work of art 
other than in, oh God, Troms and someone did a workshop years ago and they made me paint and it was terrible. So that's not what drew me to the arts. What drew me to the arts was as a collector, as a person who simply loved it. And I bought my very first painting from Harry Lunn. Harry had a gallery on Capitol Hill and went on to have another gallery in Paris. And I bought a little piece from him when I was 19. And then I met my husband when I was 20. And then we got married when I was 21. And then we started really exploring galleries. We, we loved going to museums, but really the contemporary galleries that we would visit in cities in Washington, but anywhere we went, that was where for us the excitement was. What was going on? What were the ideas? What was being explored? Who was doing it? What medium were they working in? And we were serious collectors um, with our limited income. But we had fabulous gallery directors and we had directors of these various programs and they served as, um, as really our, our master class in the arts. You would go in, you would connect with the artists, but really it was the gallery owner who spent the time with us, probably to sell us work, but also to engage with us so that we understood the work that we might be interested in buying. Um, I'm gonna pause for a second because my husband has something on upstairs and it's driving me crazy. Sweetie, Al, turn it down. Thank you. <laughs> I think I have one whole ear being filled with noise. So, so it was that, that excitement of going to the various galleries and learning. And when I decided to start exploring doing something in the arts in Chestertown, it was based on those little shows that I curated in the hallway at the Imperial and out in the dog kennels. And I called up friends in Washington. I called up the gallerists that I knew and said, would you come to Chestertown and bring work and, le and let me show it? Um, that was the beginning. Uh, Maria Summer uh, was my partner when we opened the Sony Summer. I don't know if, how many of you remember those days. That was, again, about 25 years ago. Contemporary American Craft and Fine Art. And ultimately, I made the decision to move strictly into the fine art and moved across the street and created Masoni Art and started doing strictly the fine art aspect of the last 30 years. So that's how it all began. But the key thing in it, when I decided that I was going to open up this gallery, um, Chestertown at that point, well, Chestertown has always had a really, really strong arts component. Um, there were always small art galleries. There were always groups that were doing different projects. Um, Washington College at that point did not have the coal gallery. So there was limited, limited ex exhibitions taking place at the college. But good people, wonderful lectures. You always had a fabulous poet. You always had a terrific author. The, the arts and the, the sense of creative energy was very present in this community. But I wanted to bring something different. Oh, one little, one little shout out. The person that helped me the most in opening up my gallery was Bob Ramsey. Bob Ramsey at the finishing touch, when I said to him, what do you think, Bob? Could I open up a gallery here? Of course, little did he know I was going to be his biggest framing customer, but, but he was wonderful. And he introduced me to, to um, insurance people and various others. He, he just, I think that spirit that we have in Chestertown of people reaching out, you know, that goes back 30 years. So thank you, Bob. Um, but one of the goals I have with doing the gallery was I wanted to bring different things here. Um, I felt that the, the representation of what I would call regional art was fairly strong. Uh, people who were painting the landscapes, who were, um, you know, just, just really focused on more, more of the plein air types of work. That was represented very well. I used to tease Bob. I also said, I will never have a duck in my gallery. There will never, ever, 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 ever be a duck. There will be no duck stamps. There'll be no duck paintings. There'll be nothing. 
exception to the rule happened just this last, uh, last show when a Catherine O'Brady, who's a wonderful artist, I don't know if you remember that series that she did of the Mallards that she was observing, first duck in the Masoni Art Gallery was Catherine O'Brady's. So that's how it began. Um, but the why. Um, the company I had in Washington actually did very well. It was very financially successful. Um, I would have to tell you though that the art galleries are not, um, the arts are not. And you don't go into it with the idea that it's going to be the, the mega business or any of that. You really have to go into it because you love it. You have to, you have to want to do it. Um, I felt that the invitation that I had to be part of the creative life of the artists that I knew, that they let me in. You know, um, my skill set, I'm, I'm a very good curator. I'm an excellent editor, but I am not a creator. And the people who have that ability to go into a studio to create something that never existed. If you, if you know Stephen Sondheim made a hat where there never was a hat. Um, that wonderful feeling of it didn't exist until I wrote the poem. I did the painting. I did that. And I, you know, I'm, I'm one of 10 children. I'm in the middle. So I, I think I've always just been one of those people who follows. I'm a follower in many ways. And I loved being invited into this world by all of the artists that I have interacted with and being invited to be part of something so meaningful to them meant to me that I needed to bring that same, that same almost sacred trust to that this is not something where you just put the work on the wall and sell it. You are investing in another person's life, you're investing in another person's creative juices, energy, whatever you want to call it, and you have an obligation. And I always felt that I had an obligation to do this. So that's sort of the why. Um, I have notes all over the place about what is it like to run a gallery, all of those kinds of things, but it might be helpful at this stage, because I think I was supposed to talk for 15 minutes, right, Anne? Um, if, if someone had a, a, a question or a direction or something that they were interested in that they'd like me to talk about. Could you- And if you do, talk, just unmute yourself, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about how you got involved in CREATE? Well, CREATE actually came about years ago through Masoni Summer. Um, back in the very beginning, 30 years ago, I loved American craft. And so American craft for me was uh, it, 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 tremendously exciting. The, the, the actual people making things, makers, if you will, in all of their ways. So I used to go to the shows. And when Marie and I decided, I had this little teeny weeny shop in the Imperial Hotel back in those days. And then we moved over to where the movie theater is, where the Garfield is right now. That was, that whole first floor was Masoni Summer's Craft Gallery, and then upstairs was the Fine Art Gallery. And, and I just fell in love with all of the craft artists over the years. But during that time period, my partners, Marie, well, they weren't my partners, but my, my cohorts in crime were Maria and, uh, and Alice. And they were getting ready to have children. And I, I knew there was no way I was going to be able to juggle all of it by myself. So I decided to make the move across the street and become strictly fine arts. Then we had, um, when Chestertown's been growing so much with all of the sort of the arts, uh, uh, galleries opening, arts and entertainment district, creation of river arts, which was Chester River Craft and Art a thousand years ago when I was working with it, um, which also, by the way, Chester River Craft and Art, which ultimately became river arts, actually started in the basement of the Imperial Hotel in the little coffee shop that we had, where Lolly and 
I can't remember how many other different people. Well, I can't, Lolly can share that later. But these people who just knew the time had come for us to be creating ways for people to be makers. So back up. During that time, right at, as all of this is happening, I'm looking around and I'm realizing that in Chestertown, we also had these, what I would call mastercraft people. Uh, they were Vico Van Voss and Bob Ortiz and uh, uh, Patty and Dave and Marilee and Faith and others. And we thought, well, this is silly. Why don't we band together and market the, the incredible artists that we have here in Kent County? So we became Art at Chestertown and we did a series of marketing campaigns. We went to the American Craft Council show in Baltimore and we took a whole group of booths and made a whole section of just us, the Art at Chestertown group, which was very successful and a lot of fun. And then ultimately we decided now's it, now's it's, it is time for us to have a storefront, if you will. And my role in that, it, uh, you know, I think my role has always been to be the cheerleader, to you know, just to be the one that says, oh, let's go build the fort, and also to be the curator. But the heart and soul of Create are the creators. And that's the exciting thing about uh, Create, I think, is that the creators are on the premises and you go in and you can connect with them. And all the other people that we exhibit at Create are nationally known American craft artists. Question? Could you talk about how you select the artists that you? Colleen, I lost you. Go back. Pop yourself. Yeah, you're still off. Yeah. Could you could you talk about how you choose the artists you exhibit at the gallery? Well, in in many cases they choose me, but not all. In the very beginning, um, because I had been collecting art, um, I went to the artists that I knew and I went to the gallerists that I knew and said would you be willing to come to Chestertown and let me exhibit you at the hotel at that point point?" Um, and then when I opened up the gallery galleries like Stephen Scott Gallery in uh, Baltimore Stephen was wonderful and he represented almost exclusively uh, women artists and so I reached out to him on a couple of occasions and then I'm going to promptly forget the name right now but Alan Shepard in New York City Alan is another gallerist that became a good friend and Alan and I would often share uh, ideas about people we thought were pretty extraordinary. Um, the, the key thing, the, I basically for the most part made a decision not to represent local artists. I felt that the local art scene was being represented well. Um, there were, I don't, I'm not going to remember the name, but um, it was a, there was a wonderful group of women where the cheese shop is that had a frame shop there and, and they had a gallery in there. And when my daughter was at Kent County High School, that was the first place she exhibited was there. Um, and it was, it was great. So I wanted it to be, I wanted things to be different. I have to believe in the work that the artist is doing. And by that, when I say believe in it, um, I go back to when I was doing the hiring for people. I look, I look at the bio. I look at the resume only to see the progression of the work that someone is doing. You know, how seriously do they take themselves? How focused are they in terms of their work? There, there are a couple of interesting exceptions to this. Um, one time I had uh, an artist walk in off the street and he, he was perfectly lovely, older gentleman, white haired, very handsome, couldn't be nicer. And I sort of have a policy of trying not to interact with people off the street. If, you know, if someone wants to set up an appointment, that's fine. Um, and I will tell you, since the recession in 2008, I made a very strong policy of really making sure I was representing the artists who had been incredibly loyal to me all those years during a time period when, when the arts were suffering. They were gonna be on the wall. They were gonna be on the wall. But so this gentleman walks in and, and he's so nice. And he said, and I, he said, I wanna show you my work. 
And I said, well, what is it? And he said, boats. And, and I said, okay. I said, maybe we could do something later. And he said, well, they're in the car. And so he asked me to come out. Well, I walked up High Street to, the car, to his van and I looked inside. And there were the most amazing sculptures I had ever seen in my life. The most fantastical, extraordinary things. This was H. Lee Hershey, who had graduated from Yale, studied with Joseph Albers, created the studio arts department at Williams College, taught there for 32 years, happened to be wandering through Chestertown and thought he'd pop in and show me his boats. And I represented Lee until he died. And it was such, a, uh, such an absolute joy. So when someone walks in off the street, I do always try and remember Lee, if you just that wonderful thing with him. So I, I write what I've been doing recently. I'm fascinated with people who are um, exploring uh, different um, mediums and different techniques. I mean, in this show that I've got coming up, Elemental, in the front room, I have a, an artist, Heidi Fowler, whose work I love. Heidi has made, it, made a decision. Um, she's a very strong environmentalist, but first and foremost, she's an artist. The environmentalist part of it is, is, a, is a heart conviction of hers, of something that she wants her work to be meaningful about. Well, she made a decision that all of her work's going to be made out of trash. So her pencil now is virtually everything that she can find. Um, she collected stuff when her, her father-in-law died. She's picked up materials. She stopped on the side of the road. But they are absolutely exquisite. They are so fine. I mean, this is not let's throw it together. Let's do an installation of stuff. She, she uses it as, as, as this fabulous medium. So in this current show, I have a piece at the top of the stairs made out of uh, those envelopes, you know, envelopes that you get from banks or you get from, um, they're, they're designs you can't see through them and they usually have pattern on the inside of them. She collected them. The entire piece is made out of strips of those envelopes. The other piece at the front of the gallery is made out of tin can tops that she has created into a piece that looks like the most amazing Chinese or Japanese relic. She's patinaed them, she took buttons, she's added them to it, it's gorgeous. And then the other piece is made out of bottle caps. And inside each bottle cap is a phrase and a story and a tonality. So when it all goes up, it almost reads as a landscape. And next to it, is Blake Conroy, who has a nine foot corn stalk that is laser cut paper. And underneath of it, he has printed out. And so you're seeing through the paper, the, the corn, you're seeing the corn, you're seeing through it. The contract that farmers have to sign by Monsanto when they use the genetically modified corn um, that, that on their fields. And they have to sign a contract and, it, and it's so gross, it's called the stewardship contract. So he's printed it out behind this piece. And then across from it, he's done the most beautiful uh, portrait, laser cut paper of Rachel Carson. So I got Rachel Carson looking at the corn and all of these different other things up. And it's, it's so exciting. And what was exciting to me was Look, look at the pencils these people are using. Look at what they're using to create art. And anyway, very, very exciting. Another question. George, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I have okay. a question, which, which actually we could do another time, maybe if it's not on this topic, but I've got a couple younger friends artists and one is actually doing pretty well in New York like really well like she's supporting herself and um, and a couple others that you know are in their 20s and trying to find their way how do I they, they, they look at me and go 
how can I come become successful? I'm like, I don't know. I, I'm, like, I'm like you, you know, I just buy it. <laughs> but do you have a yeah. couple tips or what, you know, the environment well, today, I, they need to be online, I, whatever. And Mark, I do have a couple of tips. Separately. First of all, the most important thing you can do with any artist you believe in is buy their work. Just buy their work. I'm it's doing like, that. Do it. Keep, keep, I know you do that. Keep doing it. The second thing is, it, it's a really weird world out there right now. Um, sadly, oftentimes the, um, the school that the artist has gone to, if they've been at Yale or they've been at you know, SCAD or they've been at this one or that one or California, that will open doors for them and perhaps get them initial exhibits. I, I have to preface all this with, I do think that um, the day of the gallery uh, is, the gallerist is coming to a close. I, I, I don't see this, um, I don't see what I've spent my life doing as something that necessarily is going to continue because I think that the big galleries and the artsies and the this ones and that ones are all doing everything online, the art fairs, all of that. It's a very different world. And I think it's a very, very hard world for the young artists to break into. I think in terms of if someone is, you know, an artist must make art. They have to make art. Doesn't make any difference if anybody buys it or not. You're gonna, you're gonna, if you're a maker, you're a maker. So I think the first thing you do is you look around into your own community and you think, what is available? I always tell people about river arts. I always say, join the Maryland Federation of Art, join river arts, pay your dues for Maryland Hall, do any of these things that you can, because guess what? Your tax dollar is supporting these institutions and you have a right to submit your work and, and put your applications in and see if you can get your work into these shows. I think the most important thing I can say is be, be prepared, have a great resume. If you're only gonna get one piece in the show, you know, fine. But make sure when you show up, you, you have other examples of your work available to show someone. Once you're in two, three, four, five exhibits and you get best in show and you get exposure and for the last five years, you've had exhibits in XYZ, you now have a resume and you can begin to market yourself with that resume. Um, I, I had an interesting woman the other day, uh, she was at Heron Point and she said, would you just come over? Would you just come over and look at my work and give me direction? She said, I'm all over the map. And I said, well, that's the problem. <laughs> You're all over the map. Focus. Yeah. What are you trying to say? What are you exploring? That doesn't mean that you don't change and you don't take chances and you don't go in different directions. But for God's sake, spend the time to really fully explore an idea or a technique or, or whatever, it, whatever it might be. I see Sandra down there and I'm going to just tease her a little bit because, you know, when Neil was putting together his book when he was doing his photo go the extra mile do it take the time produce it it may not result in success but you will have taken your idea and you will have moved it through the phases that it needs to go through now oh, lo and behold he did it he did do it <laughs> he did do it and 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 you know by god it was yeah. A wonderful accomplishment. So, w what I do as a gallerist, and this is the, this is kind of the difference. It, it, and I wish there were I wish there more were more galleries. You know, I spend my time making sure my artists get into museums, get into. I work with art consultants all over. I play, place work at Capital One. I place work in in uh, the American Board of Surgery in Philadelphia in other corporate groups. Yeah, I filled the NEA when the, when the administrator of the NEA, who was a friend, and she said to me, National Endowment for the Arts, she said, there's no art. There's no art on the walls. What do I do? I said, fine. You know, so I called all my Washington friends, Washington artists. We filled her, her, the place with it. Did it. It didn't result in any sales, but it was on their resume. Work in this place. 
Um, I have worked with the State Department for 20 some odd years now in their art and embassies program. I've had my artists work with them all over the world. Now that's a case where the artist allows the piece to go. They pay all of the shipping, they pay all of the everything else, but they allow it to go into um, the collection for a two year period. You can't beat that exposure when you add that to, to the bottom line. And several of my artists, I don't know if any of you saw the piece that I did on my friend Elizabeth Ahern, who died of COVID. I sent it out through my, um, my email blast and it appeared in a number of different places. But I introduced Elizabeth to the Art and Embassies program. Now, Elizabeth studied with Helen Frankenthaler. So, I mean, and she, she was a fully established artist. She hadn't had an opportunity to be part of that. She is now in collections in Angola, collections in Portugal. She taught at one of the major universities in Portugal. And this is, and, and I'll take the credit for this. This is when you have a gallerist who is constantly opening doors, constantly trying to find opportunities for your artists to, to be in these kinds of collections and get that kind of exposure. And you make no money doing it. This, you do this, you do this because this is the best thing you can do for your artists. Those of you that remember Vico von Voss, when Vico had his exhibit at the Academy Art Museum, some of you were around. For someone like a Vico, okay, he, he makes furniture. He doesn't have 40 pieces lined up back at home that when the museum says to him, and they did, Vico, we want you to do a show. You can have both galleries. Well, <laughs> What do you do? Um, how are you going to fill it? You're going to call someone and get your table back? <laughs> okay, uh -huh. this, this community, this this community did the most amazing thing. We created this thing called the Seed Project, and we let the word go out that he had had this enormous opportunity. We raised forty thousand dollars to keep him salaried for the year it took him to create the work to do that show at the museum. Within the first hour of that show opening, he paid everyone back who had invested in him for that year because based on sales. And I will tell you as a young artist, as a family person, there's no way he could have done that show. He just, there's just no way he could have pulled that off. And, all of you guys too, who are supporting artists in this community, you get an opportunity for a show. Framing, do you know what framing costs? You know, an artist is told, gee, you know, you can have 10 pieces in this show. You, you could be talking about $5,000 they might need to invest in just getting the work framed so it can be on the wall. So I, again, you got someone you believe in, support them. I have a question. Um, on, on you. Um, you've told us a lot about yourself and your soul and your excitement, Carla, in talking about art. Uh, there's another aspect that, that fascinates me, and that is you've got so many um, interests and curiosity about different forms and, of art. I mean, how do you choose? How do you, is it gut? Is it um, an analytical or a technical um, aspect? Is it just your love? You, you know right away when you fall in love, like with uh, Eve Stockton's weird <laughs> COVID designs. Um, what guides you? Okay, two things. You do fall in love. You fall in love with your artists. You do, and, and you fall in love with them simply because you are so in awe of the work that people who have made it their career, their career, they go into a studio all alone and they come up with it and they, and they consistently come up with it. So you do, you do fall in love with them, that's number one. I find that I'm attracted on two levels always. Um, possibly because in my brain, I'm always curating and in my brain, I'm always editing things. There's a certain excellence I'm looking for. And I'm looking for people who take themselves 
seriously, who, who, who their career is, is serious to them. And, and, and when I see that and connect to that and feel that, it creates in me a sense of, of course I wanna be there and support you. There's another thing too, and that is the, and, and you know, it's interesting for someone who heard what Sandra just said, and you would come in and see Eve's work. And Eve's work is um, very contemporary, very pal, but you meet Eve and, and you know her, and you know that every etched wave, every single thing is brought forward by this whole person um, <clears throat> who is deeply involved in her community and her family and her, I don't think I could represent a, a mean old obnoxious creep of a person. I, I, I couldn't. And I don't know that I would even respond necessarily to their work. It, it may be, I mean, I've heard stories about Picasso and this one, and it may be that the work is absolutely incredible. But I think people who are centered, who have vision, who are creative, who have a sense of excellence, who take themselves seriously, who are willing to explore, I want to get on that bandwagon. I, I want to be on that bandwagon. It's as simple as that. And the other thing is, I want you to be on their bandwagon. Um, those of you who have purchased art from me uh, know, I mean, I don't come in and tell you you should have this. Oh, I'll, I know the funny story. Constance Stewart Larrabee, one of the very first people I represented. And other than Kathleen Ewing in DC, I was the only gallery that showed Constance's work. She thought she was giving me the ultimate compliment when she said to me one day, Carla, you could sell ice to Eskimos. And she broke my heart. She broke my heart heart with that comment, that she thought anything I was doing had to do with how effectively I could manipulate you to buy something, with the exception of Mark. I do, I do manip manipulate Mark down there every now and then. So <laughs> anyway, no, I couldn't. I couldn't sell you something I didn't believe in, and I couldn't represent an artist and sell their work if I didn't believe in them. So that's it. That's it. I just want to make one comment. I've known Carlo now. It's going on 25 years, right? At least. Oh. Because I bought the print voyages for my daughter's yeah. wedding. And it got lost in LA. They put it in a garden shed. And it, we couldn't find it for six weeks. But anyway, um, you know, it hangs in her house. And when... Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Greg Mort, years later, did the book, Voyages. I had bought the real inexpensive coffee table book. So he came out with this book, Voyages, and I got it for hosting an artist for the plein air festival as a gift. And I thought, oh my gosh, look at right, there's the print that I sent her and it was their 25th anniversary. So I emailed Greg Moore and I said, I'm going to send you this. And would you, this is an idea, a little history of my daughter. Could you mail it to her? And he wrote this beautiful inscription and it arrived in Los Angeles. Four days later, a book arrived for me with an inscription. And well, that, he said, I, I couldn't believe that. That's the kind of people you pick. But I mean, I was that, so that, that person, Greg. Greg, yeah. Moore. That's Greg. Greg, was, Greg was one of the very first people I exhibited at back at the Imperial ah. Hotel when I was doing the curating at that time. This is a man whose work is in museums all over the world. This is a man <laughs> who is an astronomer, who is an artist. He's about the nicest human being you yes. ever want to meet. And that would be exactly the sort of thing that he would do. That's exactly the sort of thing that he would do. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Georgette, you had a question. Carla, yes. Where do your clients come from? You're the buyers of the work. 
Uh, like mostly, mostly, I would say um, surprising number from uh, New Jersey. Um, the next biggest group would be from the Philadelphia area, um, all over Maryland, um, Mung you know, the whole Maryland suburban area, Virginia. I have developed a interesting group of people from uh, North Carolina. I, I, you know, I have no idea except maybe they come to Chestertown and they see us here. Couple in California, um, all, all over. We have a joke about Chestertown being the center of the universe. So sooner or later, everybody's going to come through one way or another. But if if you, if I were to look. Um, Many people were folks that came and maybe had second homes here, um, mm -hmm. have moved away, but they've stayed, they've stayed connected. Now, what's happening, of course, is that I'm 73 and my clients are in their 70s, many of them, um, and it's a different time. I'm very excited when my, I call them my 40, 50 year olds. And it's interesting that the, the, world is changing, that so many young people are not buying a home. And, and if they're buying a home, of course, like everybody I know seems to live in Brooklyn and in, in, in two rooms, you know. <laughs> so they're not nesting, they're not buying homes, they're not buying art yeah. to put in their home. But I think one of the most exciting things that is, that is happening, I mean, if I thought art was just about the purchasing part of it. I look at the things like what River Arts does. I look at almost all of you as I'm looking around here, I know you're all making something. I, ha I, I said something to somebody the other day. You come to Chestertown and you're not here very long before you, you feel like you gotta go, you gotta go do it yourself. So you end up in the clay studio or you're taking a class with Mary or you're doing whatever. You wanna make it, you wanna weave it, you wanna play in the clay, you want to do that. That to me is what arts in America, that's what it's about. And I, I just recently went on the board at the Kent Cultural Alliance and I am blown away, impressed with what the Maryland State Arts Councils and various others are doing about bringing arts into our community, about broadening the base in terms of the communities that we reach out to. This is, this is arts in action. This is what's exciting, is that it isn't in some, you know, lofty gallery. It isn't about that. It's about everyone being part of it. I think, though, someone asked me the question before about create. One of the reasons it was so important to do create the way we did it uh, was everybody can be a weekend warrior. Everybody can make the wonderful piece can explore and do, and they can be terrific. But the artist who commits their life and works and does it, I want to make sure that they have exposure, that they are, that, that they're being elevated, that we are celebrating the excellence in their work, that we are looking to it for inspiration. And I think that's, that's another part of a whole experience of the arts. That's wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, it is now already 5.45. This time has just flown minute. by. And <laughs> I know. Can you believe it? Good job. Um, I, we, we try to, to keep it to 45 minutes so that people want to come back next time and have time to go eat dinner or whatever you're going to do. Um, so I would like to thank Carla, first of all, for sharing. I, I, there was a lot that I didn't know about you or, and about even about Chestertown, even though um, I grew up around here. I was gone when you got here, pretty much. And so you filled in a lot of blanks for me um, about what was happening here while I was elsewhere. Um, and so we like to end with a toast. So before, I wrote down some. Before yeah, you went, go ahead. Before you go, there's a person down here at the bottom of my screen, Lolly Sherry. And I would like to do a little shout out to Lolly. Lolly and I have been bumping into each other and doing things in Chestertown.
probably as long as anybody else. And I just would say hi, Lolly. <laughs> hi, Carolyn. Th mm -hmm. Thanks for a great talk. <laughs> I actually learned some things too, even though I've been coming to your gallery for 25 years. Forever. And I still have lovely I still have a lovely silk scarf that I still wear that was bought from your uh, shop over across the street. Good art never fades. Okay, I, I'm sorry, Mariah. <laughs> um, I, I too am glad that Lolly is here because I, I don't know if you've joined us for one of these yet, but I was really happy when I got your email this afternoon. Um, so I, I wrote down as you were speaking, I wrote down some words that you said and also that just came to me um, about to kind of reflect your story. And I think, um, and, and that they remind me of what I know about you from having gotten to know you a little bit over the last couple of years since I've been back in the area. And, um, and I think they are also words that really we can use right now. Um, we're in a very odd time, as we all know. It's troubling, it's scary, it's, um, I keep saying we have to learn how to live with uncertainty, and, and that keeps being even more true every day than, I, than it was the day before. Um, and I think, Carla, that you are really providing us a good model for how to, how to just keep, keep following the path that feels right. Um, some of the words that I wrote down are curiosity, adventurousness, bravery. Um, you said explore, you used the word explore a whole bunch of times when you were speaking. And I think that that really, when I come to your gallery, that's how I feel. Like it's, it's an exploration every time. Your artists are exploring, you are exploring, and I feel like I'm doing some exploration whenever I'm there. Um, so thank you for that. And I guess what I would um, want us to toast to tonight is um, as we navigate these, um, you know, three pandemics, I don't know, we have COVID, we have racial justice, we have an economic crisis. Maybe there are, we have a climate crisis that is still with us. Yeah, we've um, about and that. So there are, I know, I know. You can't keep them all in your mind at the same time. So, so we are, um, you know, this is a very scary, but also I feel like it's a precious time because we have so many choices that we can make right now that will send us in one direction or another. And so um, I think I would like to toast to that spirit of um, bravery and exploration and um, curiosity that has sent you, Carla, to this place where you have this wonderful community um, and you're such an important part of it and you are elevating others, as you said. And I think that's, um, that's something we can all do every day to help us all get through this time. So to Carla and to curiosity and bravery and exploration and, and thank you all thank for being you. here with us thank you